We spend on average 55% of our day listening, Vanessa. Sales professionals spend up to 60% of their day listening and executive leaders or sales leaders will spend up to 80% of their day listening. So if there's one skill that you want to hack, it's how to get your listening moving from just listening to what they're saying to start to listening to what they're not saying. Welcome to the Quotable Podcast. I'm your host, Vanessa Haney. Today, I'm sitting down with deep listening expert, Oscar Trimboli, and we're discussing the power of listening and techniques to hone your listening skills to improve your relationships with prospects and customers. Thanks so much for joining us today, Oscar. How about we start by having you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your work? Thanks, Vanessa. I'm on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world. And for a lot of us selling every day, we've attended training courses where we've been told it's really important to listen to the prospect. It's really important to listen to our customer. And we get a platitude like two ears and one mouth, use it in that proportion. And most of us, as a result, really listen in black and white. And I want to help salespeople become more productive to work on the opportunities that matter and just as importantly not work on the ones that you can't help with how can you refer those maybe to other people as well so we want to move people from listening in black and white to starting to listen in color and how do you define listening in black and white versus listening in color listening in black and white is really just listening to words it's how you use your ears and it's how you use your eyes. So it's only two dimensional listening. You're only listening for what they say and what you can see or sense in terms of body language. And that's helpful and it's a great starting point because most sales professionals probably get into a state where they're listening for code words that go, ah, that's a word I can attach my product to but it's not necessarily going to be able to solve their problem. So listening in color means you're listening through five levels of listening. And the five levels of listening are listening to yourself, listening to the content, listening for the context, listening for what's unsaid, and then finally listening for meaning. And most of us drift off while we're listening to a customer or prospect discuss with you the current state of the opportunity or the problem they're solving because we don't know this very simple rule of neuroscience. And if you're only taking one thing away from today's discussion, it's the 125 400 rule. You speak at 125 words a minute, but you can listen at up to 400 words a minute. So you fill in the gaps and you drift away for those 300 words where the speaker isn't speaking nearly as quick as you can listen. In fact, it's happening for you right now while you're commuting or driving your car or preparing a proposal and listening to this great interview with Vanessa. I think a lot of people think that they're good listeners, but is there a way to self-evaluate to determine, am I really in need of some fine tuning on my skills? Yeah, there's three statistics I'd love to share. 86% of people think they're above average IQ. 83% of people think they're above average car drivers and 81% of people think they're above average listeners. So none of us really knows what good is. And I've researched and continue to research over a three year period, 1,410 people in our research database about what people actually struggle with when it comes to listening. So see if you can relate to any of these as it relates to listening. The biggest barriers getting in people's way when they listen is their ability to focus when they're in a conversation, their ability to be distracted either before, during or after the conversation. And finally, it's about their ability to pay attention, not only to what the people are saying, but what they're not saying as well. So for most of us, We can remember a great math teacher at school or can remember a great English teacher at school, but none of us can remember our listening teacher. We spend on average 55% of our day listening, Vanessa. Sales professionals spend up to 60% of their day listening and executive leaders or sales leaders will spend up to 80% of their day listening. So if there's one skill 
that you want to hack, if there's a skill in the 21st century you want to focus on, it's how to get your listening moving from just listening to what they're saying to start to listening to what they're not saying. When a salesperson sits down with a potential customer, do you have any recommendations about what they should be paying attention to or how they should be thinking about the conversation and what the prospect is saying to really get underneath what they're saying verbally and what they're actually trying to convey? Yeah, so remember that 125-400 rule. They can speak at 125 words a minute. You can listen at 400, but for them, the speaker, they can speak at 125 words a minute, but they think at up to 900 words a minute. So the minimum is about 600 words a minute. The maximum is about 1,500 words a minute. So the, the maths and the neuroscience of their ability to even verbalize what they're thinking about, think about this, Vanessa, there's a one in nine chance that what they're saying the first time when you meet the prospect is actually what they're thinking about. And in complex B2B selling today, on average, there's 10 to 15 people involved in the sales process. So the likelihood that they're going to give a full, complete representation of where the organization is in the very first version of what they say, it's not true. There's an 11% chance what they say is actually what they're thinking. I don't know about you, Vanessa, but if I went to a doctor and he gave me an 11% chance of surviving a surgery, I'd be asking for a second opinion. So as sales professionals, the thing we want to be asking more and more is a second opinion from the prospect or the customer as it relates to the opportunity. There's a couple of really skillful questions that you want to become a ninja at. You want to become really proficient at. You want to become so skilled at these questions. And as sales professionals, a lot of sales methodologies, a lot of sales training will teach you about the importance of why-based questions. So why is the organization doing this? Or why is the organization doing this now? The tipping point for most sales professionals is getting more comfortable with asking how and what based questions to unpick the other 800 words stuck in their head. I don't know about you, Vanessa, but I have the duties at home to wash the clothes. And even on my washing machine, it has more than one rinse cycle. And when a human speaks, it's the rinse cycle for their brain. So if a washing machine can do something twice to rinse something out, I think as sales professionals, we need to get really comfortable with a couple of questions. I'm curious what else is happening with regard to this opportunity. No matter what they say the first time, ask that question. I'm curious what else is happening around this opportunity. And then the prospect will start to use beautiful coded language. And while you're listening, you'll all be nodding. They'll say words, well, actually, or they'll say words, well, you know what's really critical on this right now? Or the most important thing is, or you know what? What I haven't told you is, and don't get too mechanical on this. If you ask that question in a repetitive way over and over again, the prospect will just think you're actually not listening to them. But spend some time exploring and unpicking what they haven't said. It's the ultimate move that shows them respect because it helps them think through their problem a little bit more. And they'll start to say, wow, they were able to help me not only with the opportunity, but with my thinking around this. If there were two other tips I'd give in terms of thinking about listening, what distinguishes good sales leaders from great sales leaders? Good sales leaders are focused on their customers' problems, and that's useful. But great sales leaders are focused on their customers' customers' problems. If you can talk about how your solution helps their customers, not just them as a customer, you'll have a completely different dialogue. A lot of us don't listen for the next sale, by the way, Vanessa. And what I mean by that is, even if you've done a great job of speaking to the person who's in front of you, a powerful question would be, who, so this is a who-based question, who else do you need to explain the business case to? And what you'll start to unpick really quickly is what they've heard, what they're going to say, and just as importantly, what they're not going to say. Because again, the difference between a good 
sales leader and a great sales leader, a good sales leader, sells their solution to try and beat the competition. But what you want to do ultimately is help the prospect sell the business case internally. I was working with an organization in New Zealand, Vanessa, a couple of years ago, last quarter of the financial year, they were the preferred vendor and they were going through the procurement process and with a week to go, they'd forecast the deal as a win and they were in procurement and that the deal would be closed before the end of the final quarter, the end of the financial year and a lot of great bonuses for three people on this sales team. But what they didn't ask was, what's the CFO's perspective? What does finance think about this? And what they didn't understand was in the background, they were selling software in the call center, by the way. So they were competing against other technologies in software in call centers. What they didn't realize in the background is Kimberly Clark, a company made famous for selling diapers, but also a company that sells toilet paper had done a deal with a CFO. If they bought all of next year's toilet paper in advance, they would give them 50% off. And all of a sudden, the deal that they thought they'd won, which they had, they'd beat their competition, but they hadn't won the business case. And the CFO deferred this project for another nine months. Mm -hmm. They still won the deal, but if they would have listened to what's on the CFO's agenda, they may have had a different approach. So listening for the business case is one thing I'd love all of us to start thinking a little bit more about as we engage with our prospects and get to listen, what's it going to take to get the business case over the line, not just beat the competition. A lot of what you've talked about sounds like it's very much in-person conversations with how much people communicate electronically or virtually these days. How do you adapt for that and overcome the challenges that presents itself when you're not physically sitting down with someone to have these conversations? Yeah, I think the modality of how we engage with our prospects is a mindset. There are just as many advantages as there are disadvantages in face-to-face -face versus webinars or virtual technologies. So one of the things I always do is make sure I know what the weather's doing in your part of the world. So it's a really sunny day in San Francisco today, Vanessa. And just that little icebreaker straight away means I'm getting into their mindset. Even though I'm not connected physically, I'm trying to replicate a bit of the chat that you would have going from the reception area into the meeting room as an example. So the technology allows us to do that. If you know the prospect a little better, at least the organizations I work with always asking the prospect to show around the room. So use the webcam on their computer. Hey, you know, I'm curious what's around in your office and you might notice whether it's an open plan office or you might notice if they in a meeting room and you might get a sense of the organization from that. Is it really busy? Is it noisy? Is it quiet like a library? So I think for a lot of us, the mindset is not is virtual less than face-to-face, -face, I think it has some very different advantages for, for a lot of our prospects and our customers. They see it as a great way to be time effective with them. But it, as a result of that, it also gives us an opportunity to be more connected with them as well. And that's only one dimension of the encounter. That's actually the conversation as it happens. One of the things I always make sure that the prospects organizations and customers that I work with and say is really useful, always set up a Google alert for the person that you're working with. And that becomes a way to have a warm conversation with somebody that says, hey, Vanessa, I noticed you recently were in an article published in the Chief Sales Officer magazine, and you made a great point about the difference between selling face-to-face -face versus selling over technologies. And just that little bit of listening it's automated. You only have to set and forget it once. It'll come straight into your inbox. It's free. And it's a really simple way to show the customer that you're listening without being there face to face with them. That's an interesting concept that takes listening out of direct conversation and opens it up to listening to what's being said about this individual or what this individual is saying about themselves to others. 
Yeah, if you want to make more warm calls than cold calls, Google Alert becomes your friend. I was working with a client in a professional services organization about two years ago, and they took this on board and they started to implement this as a um, what they called a warm-up strategy and the kinds of titles that they're working with, uh, CEOs, the chair of the board, they're working with a chief strategy officer, and these people are typically interviewed, so their online profile is quite prolific. But what they started to do was not only say, hey, great article today about da 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 they started adding value and making distinctions about what they were talking about in that article or commenting on that article or sharing that article in their networks as well. So that little bit of listening moves listening from a one-on-one -on -one conversation to a really proactive conversation that moves you from cold calls to warm calls, from cold contact to warm contact. Now, not everybody's prospect's going to have a great online presence. That's okay. Um, but it's just a really simple hack in the virtual world. How much of the listening that you're doing is about body language too, of what they're not actually saying, but how they're physically expressing themselves while they're having these conversations? Yeah, and even right now, you should be able to pick up while you're listening to me, how close am I to the microphone right now, as opposed to how close am I to the microphone right now. Mm. Even over the telephone, you can pick up body language, and the way to do that is be very careful to notice their breathing. So if they're hunched over when they're speaking on their phone, their, their breathing is constricted and will be shallow. And if their shoulders are back and their spine is in an upright position, they'll project a lot more on the phone. Let's talk about that, Vanessa, in two ways. Let's talk about it first over the phone and then we'll talk about it face to face. What we're always looking for is congruency. So I interviewed the human lie detector, a lady called Susan Constantine, who works over in New York, and she trains circuit court and Supreme Court judges in how to listen for body language. And the thing that she said to me when I spoke to her is too many people assume the most basic things about body language. Their arms are crossed, so they're defensive. Their arms are crossed, they're not buying your idea. And it could be, as Susan said, their arms are crossed because they're sitting under the air conditioning duct and it's really cold right now. Mm -hmm. In terms of sensing body language and energy, and I'll talk about the difference in a moment about that, we need to understand congruency. We need to understand is what they're saying aligned with the context of what they're doing as well as what they're saying making sense with their tonality, with their breathing pattern, and the subject matter. For a lot of us, we don't need a lot of training as humans. We can intuitively pick it up. But because we're so busy, we're not picking up the signals. Mm. And for a lot of us as sales professionals, particularly on the phone, turn off all the distractions. As tempting as it is to update your Salesforce opportunity page real time while you're talking to the prospect, that very act will distract you, which is one of the top three things that gets in the way of listening. Just be present in the moment and focus on, can I hear their breathing? If I can hear their breathing, you'll start to notice things differently. You'll also start to notice things like vocal cord range, I was working with an organization in Hungary. They do some outsourcing work. And I noticed one of the leaders, English wasn't their first language, but when they use a particular phrase in English, their vocal cords kind of fried. They went down here. And what they were expressing and how their vocal cords were expressing it like this, I could sense there was some tension for them in saying that. So I just paused and I asked them, hey, on that topic, is there a better word in Hungarian for that? And they said, well, yeah, it would be this. But what I noticed when they said it was, they said it without the fry, it wasn't a tension in their voice. And then I said, now if you said that in English, and they just said it without the fry. So what they were struggling with is just finding the word in their head. And again, for a lot of prospects, it's just struggling for those words in their head. But if you're typing into your Salesforce opportunity page, it's really hard to be focused on that level of nuance in listening to a voice over the phone. Does that make sense, Vanessa? Definitely. And again, in face-to-face, -face, 
particularly notice not only the body language of the, of the person you're addressing, the body language of the other people in the room, but even the position that people tend to look at the pole position in the room. There's always a person who, when they come into the room, everybody turns to face them. It's not something defined by an organizational chart or a title. It's the person who has the power in the room. So notice seating position as much as you're noticing body language. The big thing I always say to people is notice their energy as well as their body language. And their energy can be how they present on a particular topic. We were working with a group about four years ago, they were a technology company. And in the room, there was basically 11 people and there were two camps in the room. And it was really obvious who was in which camp. They all weren't sitting together. But when a particular topic about the progress of the opportunity was being discussed, three people in the room had a completely different energy and posture to the conversation compared to the rest of the room. And so what I did was I picked up on that and just said to the group, you know, when it comes to the business case on these types of things, typically we have two to three different approaches. I talked about approach A and approach B, and sometimes there's an approach C. And what I was trying to do was flush out the elephant in the room, the unspoken in the moment. And this is a listening, not only for what's unsaid, but listening for context level three. How do people socialize ideas internally? By me just posing the question that the group didn't want to discuss, they discussed it in front of me. Hmm. And all of a sudden, issues that hadn't been discussed about resourcing and consulting services required to get this from implementation to embedded in the organization, one of the big unspoken issues in the opportunity came about. But do you see, Vanessa, that walking in with a set of questions that you want to race through. You're not going to pick up any of this if you're not paying attention to the room. And to do that, you've got to pay attention to yourself. Three tips for that. Remove the distractions, laptops, iPads, anything that buzzes and beeps. Drink water. A hydrated brain is a listening brain. And if you drink coffee, you're going to have to drink an extra glass of water for every cup of coffee you have because coffee is going to dehydrate you. And the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. A hydrated brain is a listening brain. So let's make sure that not only you carefully manage your state, but it gives you the opportunity to listen on a completely different level in the room. I'm not suggesting you do yoga before you go to every sales meeting or you do that before you pick up the phone. But in that moment, between the time you dial and the time they connect, just notice your breathing. And from the time you walk into the lobby to your sign in to reception or announce yourself to the reception, just notice your breathing and just go, what's my intention for today? And how can I breathe a little bit deeper? And then the moment you speak to that person, then you're in the moment. We've spoken a lot about interactions between buyers and sellers, but I can imagine within an organization, these skills could be extremely useful. Yeah, particularly as it relates to sales and marketing, particularly as it relates to marketing and finance, particularly as it relates to human resources and operations. These skills are really critical, but even in working with, if you need a buddy when you're selling, if you're in technical selling roles, you might have somebody who's a technical expert coming along with you or a subject matter expert as well. Just the simple question, what do you want to get out of the meeting today? Or what do you think could be a concern that they haven't considered in the meeting today? Mm. Same principles hold true. Try and avoid why-based questions. I've interviewed suicide counselors and FBI hostage negotiators and deaf interpreters. And they all talk about people get defensive if they get asked why questions too early and what, how, and who, and where-based questions seem a little bit simpler to answer, there's less at risk. Don't get me wrong, why questions have their place, but I think as Westerners particularly, we place way too much emphasis on why-based questions and not enough emphasis on using silence and being comfortable with silence in a dialogue as well. This sounds like something that really takes some practice. Yeah, I was working with a Japanese company 
and the managing director had me speak to their people manager community and he said i've read the book easy to read very applicable for every one of us in the room hard to practice and the japanese are masters of lean of kaizen which is all about consistent improvement and it's no coincidence that if you look at the martial arts you think about white belts and black belts in the martial arts that's all about practice and practice and practice and the thing about the minute you become a black belt or really competent at any particular skill your job is to unlearn and relearn so for me i think the difference between me and people who are struggling with their listening is i know i'm going to get distracted vanessa when i'm listening to somebody but i have simple techniques like drink a glass of water breathe a little bit more deeply don't get distracted as well as there's a phrase a lot of people go wow i can't believe you say that and then they go but i wish i said that and the phrase is look i'm really sorry vanessa i got distracted do you mind saying that again and for a lot of people they think that's a huge risk and it's not it's showing them that you're human showing them that you don't have a big ego showing them that what they say really matters but you're struggling with staying in the moment and i have found only in one situation in seven years that somebody felt insulted by my response to say sorry i got a little bit distracted even in that moment at the end of the meeting they said to me you know what in reflection when you said sorry i got distracted i shouldn't have got so upset what i realize is you're just being honest with me and i'm going to practice that question myself so i think for a lot of us just being comfortable with going we'll get distracted we are neurologically programmed to be distracted if you think about the 125 400 rule you're set up for failure and as long as you know that rule exists and you start to listen through the five levels of listening you'll start to listen completely differently but just like going to the gym or just like practicing and learning a new language it's just about consistently trying to apply it every single day and for a lot of my clients that just means spending time with the book or saying to a buddy hey this week i'm working on the pause I'm working on not interrupting people. When I do that, well, could you tell me after a meeting? Or when I do it poorly, can you tell me in the moment so I can correct as we go along? Mm. There's a phenomenal book I would recommend to everybody. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a New York Times bestseller. It came out in October. I read a lot of books. It's probably the best written book I've read in about 10 years. It breaks down the importance of habit change and habit change as james would say if you can surround yourself with people who can make what you're trying to do in terms of your change achievable because you've declared it that's one of three keys to success in moving your habit forward so like the gym every day like trying to learn a language the more you practice the better you'll get do you have any stats that by improving your listening skills you can actually increase your close rate with compute costs going down dramatically now, a lot of organizations are moving from recording calls for compliance purposes to recording calls for coaching purposes. And yes, there is great evidence and correlation around nearly 50,000 sales calls that have been recorded where it's got the optimum ask to speak ratio and more importantly, they've correlated that to the top performing third of sales rep, the mid third of sales reps, and the bottom third of sales reps. The bottom third sales reps have a speak to ask ratio of 72 to speak in their ratio. So they're the poorest performing sales reps. They also cut the sales calls up. These are both inbound and outbound calls, by the way. They cut the sales calls up into the first third, the second third, and the, the final third, because the speak to ask ratio should vary. Obviously at the beginning of the call, a lot more ask than if it was at the end of the call. But here's the stat that I love. Overall, the highest performing third of sales reps have a speak to ask ratio of 46% speak and 54% listen or ask. 
And in the first third of the call, the ratios are dramatically higher between the highest and lowest performing thirds in this database. And the th highest performing are asking north of 80% questions and the lowest performing are asking in the range of 60% questions. So there's a vast gap there. So the performance delta finally between the midpoint, the middle third and the top performing sales reps is a factor of 22% more productive sales reps in the first third who have the 54 to 46% ask to speak ratio compared to the midpoint. So that's basically getting you a day of sales more every day if you just spend a little bit more time asking deliberate how and what based questions. This speaks so much to what I hear time and time again of when you're meeting with prospects that you really need to get to know them and to not sell yourself and to really understand their needs and their issues for you to get where you need to get to from a sales perspective. And explore what their customers' problems are as well in those early stages. That was another distinction between high-performing sales reps in that sample that I mentioned, Vanessa, they spent so much more time, at least a third of their time asking the customer they were talking to what their customer's problem was, their customer's customer's problem. So not just what is the organizational issue, but what are their customers struggling with and finding if they could construe a solution around that, then they were incredibly differentiated as an organization. Is there a tipping point? Can you actually be listening too much? Absolutely. And I spend a lot of time talking about stop listening. Marketers do this really poorly, by the way, Vanessa. Marketers do this market research every year with customers. And all I say to them is stop doing your market research. I, I interviewed the head of Nike Asia Pacific Research out of Japan, and she also used to work for Coke. And she was the market research department. And all she did for two years was work with the organization to implement what was in the previous surveys, what the customers have already told them. So that's a really good example. And both employee engagement surveys, if you work for organizations that survey employees, stop surveying your employees and just go and do what they've already told you to do. And when you've done all of that, then you've earned the right to survey them again. How does this show up for us as sellers though? If you struggle with a really wide pipeline that's really slow in velocity and doesn't close anywhere near as quickly as you wish it would, you're probably listening way too much. So you've got opportunities that are sitting at the midpoint to the highest point in your funnel that are just too slow to move. And you, it's probably because you're spending way too much time asking questions about them, about their problems, and not asking yourself enough questions to go, honestly, are we a good match? And could you refer an organization that's better placed to solve that customer's problem and earn enormous trust as a salesperson because you haven't got the solution but you know how to solve their problem. So for a lot of people, if you look at your opportunity pipeline and you have a lot of opportunities sitting above the midpoint that are kind of stuck or moving really slow, it's time to stop asking the prospect questions and time for you to do some serious qualification and ask yourself the real question and listen to yourself and go, are we a good match? If I spent exactly the same amount of time on a really well-matched prospect, would they be further down the funnel than these? And quite often the answer is yes. So there is a time where listening is the wrong thing to do. And the difference between hearing and listening is taking action. And sometimes the most important thing you can do for the prospect is say, I don't think we're the right kind of partner to solve this problem, but I've done a little bit of research and based on the problem you're trying to solve, here's two organizations that I think can solve your problem. All of a sudden, the dynamic will change and that prospect will think about you completely differently. They'll think of you as a problem solver rather than a seller. And the next time they've got something remotely in your universe, you've just earned the trust to get into their sales cycle much earlier than any competitor. So it's also about being willing to hear things that you don't necessarily want to hear, like they're just not ready. Or we just might not be the right match. 
we might have technology that's way too early or way too expensive or way too functional for their needs. They might just need something that's really simple and you sell something that's really complex or they might need something really complex and you sell something that's really basic. But I think it's kind of taking the ego out of the sale and go, if I've got the right work ethic, I've got the right kind of opportunities in my pipeline and just listening to myself and saying, you know what, the time to work with these people isn't now, but let me become a problem solver for them and find out who might be a good match. We love to close out our podcast by asking our guests, if you could go back to the beginning of your career and give yourself advice, what would that be? My advice would be to myself, and I still give it to myself today because I still haven't learned the lesson, Vanessa. My superhero power is my cloak of invisibility. I'm great at making other people successful. But what I've realized more and more is I'm enough. Back myself and speak the truth more often. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Oscar. This has really been fascinating. Just remember this, silent has exactly the same letters as listening. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. For more conversations like this, visit quotable.com.